Hi, everybody. It's the Plant-Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Thanks for joining me today. It's a race to space. Elon Musk and Richard Branson, uh, Jeff Bezos, they're all talking about getting to space. But what are we going to eat when we get there? I can't wait to bring on my guest today. He is the CEO and co-founder of Aleph Farms, live from Israel. Didier Tubia, thanks for being with me today. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. So happy that you are here. Well, let's just dive into it. There's so much to discuss today. And you, of course, are a wealth of knowledge. For those who might not know, what exactly is clean or cultivated meat? Mm -hmm. Cultivated meat is a new way to produce meat. And, and I'll, explain, I'll explain how that works. But first, uh, I want to, to tell you what it is not. It's not alternative protein. I'll explain what I mean. Huh. Um, actually, what we do um, at Elephants and the, the you know, a couple of dozens uh, other companies developing similar technologies is uh, um, growing the meat directly from its building blocks, which are the cells, which are composed the meat we, we know we can purchase today in a grocery store or anywhere. And um, the concepts relies on um, harvesting just a few cells from an, a living animal without any harm and uh, transferring those cells into a suitable medium and outside of the animal's body, which uh, replicates the same conditions as on the inside, so that the cells continue to, to divide, to, uh, to form a muscle tissues, same as the wood inside the animal, but on the outside under control conditions. Uh, that, that's why it's not an alternative protein, it's actually real meat. Um, it's an alternative production method from it. And actually, um, the way we look at it is also um, to make sure that we just we, we don't just make proteins. Actually, meat, in our views, is a, is more of an experience for many people. Mm. It has a lot of uh, emotional content and um, a lot of uh, uh, let's say connections with the uh, you know the society we live in and is rooted in in the food and, and the people's culture. So at Alphonse, we make sure that we reproduce the real experience of meat and culinary, uh, of course, how it cooks, uh, sensory. Um, meaning uh, texture, taste, flavor of the end product, nutritional quality of the meat we know. Uh, it's not just uh, protein to fuel the body. So I, I love what you're saying. Basically, you are reproducing the insides of the cow, if you will, without having to have all the externalities that um, make that cow function. The externalities being land, water, time, but also the externalities of just the cow itself having to endure um, the, the growing process of you know, being in a factory farm. So is this why you say on your website that at Aleph Farms, you make steak in the same way that nature makes steak? Why don't you walk me through that? Mm -hmm. Aleph Farms' philosophy is to stick to nature as much as possible. And uh, same as many other breakthroughs in human history, like you know electricity, um, or uh, even the wheel, and um, have, have been invented, you know, by learning from nature. Uh, uh, inventing the wheel has, you know, is an idea which arose from looking at uh, stones just rolling uh, down a hill, and uh, people have found a way to incorporate this spontaneous phenomenon under control you know, environment, and um, we're doing the same. We learn in depth how a steak, which is a muscle tissue in a, in a cow, forms in nature, which cells compose it. And um, we learn the extracellular matrix, the way it develops this very special texture of the meat we know. And we isolate cells which have this capability of making muscle tissue in nature, mm -hmm. uh, which are natural cells. And um, we incorporate them into a cultivator, um, which is also called the bioreactor sometimes. And we bring them to the same environment and the same uh, nutrients. And uh, we replace the extracellular matrix, which is um, a support for the cells to form um, this uh, structured tissue with uh, what we call a scaffold. And we, we, we really uh, focus on um, mimicking nature and uh, keeping the same basic components uh, of nature as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I love this, nature being the ultimate engineer. And of course, why wouldn't we mimic nature? It's always proven out to be so successful for us when we do that. So it sounds great and we all want it so much and we would all 
make more money if that's your interest. We would save natural resources if that's your interest. You wouldn't have the animal the, the aggravation and harm if that's your interest and you'd get everything you want. So why don't we have it yet? When I look you up in your introduction, you talked about there are also some other companies around the world that are working on this. And I think Mosa Meat in Holland was able to produce a burger in around 2012. So here we are, 2021. Right. Please tell me what is the major hurdle that you have and when will we realistically see it at scale available to all in the marketplace? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. First, my main interest is to uh, make sure that we leave a better legacy to the future generations. And, and you know, I'm myself 47 years old and I have uh, three children. My elder mm -hmm. children is uh, 19 years old. Um, and and producing meat uh, with uh, this new process um, allows, allows not only for uh, reducing the environmental impact of, of the livestock, as you mentioned, in terms of land, water, greenhouse gas emissions, but also um, helps reducing the use of antibiotics. To the 700,000 people die from um, uh, resistance to antibiotics, and this number should increase to 2 million by 2040. Mm -hmm. And we also avoid the animal welfare issues associated with industrial farming and slaughter. Um, the, the reason why cultivated meat is not yet uh, widely available is because it, it has taken time to really um, um, develop the right uh, adaptations of the, the technologies which have been originally developed for regenerative medicine, meaning for uh, fixing disease organs in human medicine and to um, make them fit into the requirements uh, for uh, producing food. O obviously, the, the, the products are very different, even through the underlying science is, is very similar. Uh, we have to make sure that the, um, the production process would meet the, uh, the scale required, would meet the, the cost structure, which is required for a food product. We have to make sure that we can remove all the animal inputs to the process, including removing mm -hmm. the uh, fetal bovine serum, which is used in, uh, in biomedical applications for tissue engineering. And we have to make sure that we develop a um, product with the right um, a test and, and flavor, which would meet the uh, consumer's expectations. So all that is taking a lot of time. It's, it's really a deep tech type of a, um, a project. Uh, on the other hand, we've seen in the last two, three years, an acceleration of this uh, space and uh, technologies uh, are getting out of the lab and becoming much more applicable to mass production. And uh, we've seen consumer acceptance also, uh, at least the, the expected consumer acceptance because there is no product in the market yet, uh, going up very quickly. Um, large food and meat players uh, starting to jump in and uh, um, being more involved in uh, promoting those new production processes so it's, a, it's coming very quickly, um, and this process is, has been accelerating over the course of the last couple of years. Yeah, okay, so much to unpack there. I'm thrilled to hear that you and other companies, I believe, are working on getting rid of the uh, bovine serum. So that was always something mm -hmm. that I wondered if that was going to be an element that stayed or not. So I've been reading in the last six months or a year or so, at least that's come to my attention, that that's something that's working its way out of the system. So that's wonderful to know. And I didn't know that this was quasi science that already existed for human organs to replace them or help them grow. Or So that's very interesting, that jump from that kind of medical situation to this kind of, I'll say food tech situation. Usually when I have these talks, I talk about veg tech, but this doesn't fall into veg tech, of course, since you, you really are, as you say, not an alt protein, you are the protein. You're just not using as many resources, be it animals or land or time or whatever your interest is, that resource is not being used. So uh, it's, it's very efficient and effective if you can get it to work. So it's quite a complex scenario. Um, so can you give us any predictions? When do you realistically see this coming to market? Mm -hmm. um, yes, of course, we've seen the first um, regulatory approval for um, a cultivated meat product in, in Singapore last month, um, uh, obtained by Eat Just, which is a great achievement for, for the company and I think also a milestone for the industry. Uh, we believe that uh, both the US and uh, Singapore are today ready to um, approve more products in the, the next, uh, let's say, 12 months. Um, 
So we'll see during the course of 2021, probably a couple more products approved, I believe. And uh, during the course of 2022, meaning next year, uh, probably uh, probably a few more. And I, I assume it will take a few more years to really see cultivated meat going mainstream. Mm. I expect that the, the, the first two, three years of commercialization will be relatively at small scale, still kind of limited launch uh, type of uh, uh, marketing activities. Um, and until we see cultivated meat you know, on the shelf everywhere, it might take even you know a bit more time. I believe uh, it will be a staged process. Um, but uh, it's uh, it's really it's really uh, coming at our farm specifically. We focus on uh, growing steaks, meaning not a uh, minced meat or hamburger or, or other type of processed food, which is a slightly more complex technology. Mm-hmm. And we expect uh, um, we'll be in a position to launch first product during the during uh, 2022 meaning uh, next year uh, that's groundbreaking because there is such a difference between a minced meat product like a hamburger and grounds and an actual steak and i think for the flexitarian or not even the flexitarian the actual meat market they're looking for ribs steak these kind of mainstream things that can't be um simply added to the market. I'll say that. Um, Well, so uh, let's talk just a a brief minute about Singapore. I always felt that, not that I'm picking sides, I love everybody, but I sort of thought, gosh, Israel was gypped a little bit there because as I understand it, you can correct me if I'm wrong, there was already an Israeli restaurant that was serving cultivated meat. Is that right? Even though there wasn't sort of a a PR release about mainstream regulation, it was for sale in an Israeli restaurant. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's it's partially true. And uh, this was a a great achievement by Supermeat, uh, which is the the first company which has been uh, started in Israel and one of the first companies globally uh, by Ido and uh, and Shear. Actually, they they opened the restaurant, but but it's currently in a private uh, a setup. It's not yet open for the public. You have to, you know, order in advance and it's it's part of uh, some type of uh, a consumer feedbacks. But uh, but yes, uh, this restaurant has been uh, has been open before this approval in Singapore. Overall, there is um, a lot going on in Israel. Um, we have probably five companies um, in the country, including two or three relatively advanced ones. And so we're probably the second country in the world after the US in terms of a number of companies and, and a development stage, which is you know impressive for um, a country which is uh, of the size of uh, New Jersey. <laughs> yes, although um, on the consumer side, I, I believe that Israel has the most per capita vegans of any country in the United States. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yes. So a very actively engaged in this conversation, consumer base. And I want to get back to that consumer conversation in just a minute. And I also want to get back to the political conversation in just a minute of which countries are advancing. But before I do, I don't want to leave the tech realm without one more conversation, one more question. Are you at all concerned, if that's the right word, that uh, precision fermentation or biomass fermentation will sort of overshadow cultivated clean meat? We use um, precise fermentation as a um, as an enabling technology for producing a replacement to fetal bovine serum proteins. Oh, um, So actually, <laughs> a lot of the those proteins which uh, are actually in, in nature synthesized by the animal itself cannot be um, sourced you know off the shelf and we need to provide those proteins as part of the environment of the cells um, and the, the the feeding uh, um, let's say uh, mature to the cells uh, and uh, some are, are produced by uh, precise fermentation so we we don't see kind of an, a conflict between the those technologies but rather a type of a, a complement complementarity and um, beyond that there are some interesting companies, and, and again, uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, <laughs> respect for many of those companies doing, um, uh, you know, alternative to egg protein or to milk protein by by, by fermentation. It, you can't really get the, the whole thing, you know, the, the full product just by precise fermentation. You just produce um, is- isolated proteins. And uh, in terms of of a meat product, for instance, meat is much more than just one protein. And mm-hmm. 
for, for the milk industry, for instance, it, it makes a lot of sense to produce casein, for instance, which is a very functional protein out of milk, sure. which has a role for you know uh, producing cheese or others, and can be a, a supplement to uh, to some type of a plant-based cheese. But uh, we we can't make a chunk of meat or steak by fermentation. That's a great clarification. So, so for anyone listening, um, the the cliff notes here to precision fermentation is that you might take a gene, which you don't even have to take from the animal, as I understand it, they're held in databases. And so you, you take that gene and you, for lack of a better expression, I'm not a scientist, you're mapping it onto a microbe, you're giving those microbes the correct nutrients, and they can grow that protein. And then you put that protein into milk, which is um, something Remilk is doing out of Israel. Um, mm -hmm again, gross oversimplification. Um, but it's good to know because I wasn't sure if fermentation just might end up taking the place of cultivated meat. But of course, it would make sense that clean meat, cultivated meat is a much more structured product. It's a much more complex product. Um, and that's making a lot of sense. Okay, so that's nice to see that they're complementary to each other. Um, well, uh, let me ask you this. There's been a lot of talk. I, I started the conversation about the moon. So as we talk politics, I'll start with the moon and then I'll revert back to Israel and Singapore and the US. Um, you have been making cultivated meat, as I believe, on the moon. Tell me about that experience and why you were doing that, mm -hmm. that experiment and as well that experience. <laughs> yes, it was actually in the International Space Station. Uh, but we're not yet on the moon. Yes, right. Uh, yes, but, right. It, but, but it was, yes, it, it, the first time meat has been produced in space. And it was uh, very exciting because, you know, um, I mean, I, I'll explain wh why it is important for the space community and then, you know, what was Aleph Farm's angle into it. And um, one of the largest, let's say, uh, issues, the biggest issues with, uh, you know, uh, building up uh, human colonies in the outer space and on the moon or on or on Mars or even for long haul or uh, you know a, a long term space exploration is the the inability to produce food in space you okay. you have to feed the people you know so if you have a colony on Mars you have to produce food locally you cannot ship it from earth it won't work it's too far <laughs> yes. and, anybody who <laughs> shipped anything from new york to california knows that it will not work from california <laughs> to the moon yeah exactly um so actually uh, and and meat is a big issue because it it, it requires a lot of uh, land arable land water and 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 you can't find that in uh you know in in any place uh, outside of earth and um, so it was it was super exciting with the uh, disrespect um, from our standpoint, what was very important was uh, to look at space as um, as a lab for uh, pushing the frontiers of sustainability. And we, we have performed this experiment with uh, our partners uh, 3D bioprinting uh, solutions. And uh, we've used actually um, very advanced uh, 3D bioprinting uh, um, uh, technologies to, to get there and, and develop unique protocols. And we believe that when we're able to produce meat in uh, in space and um, we really uh, we really implement the most advanced uh, uh, circular uh, production uh, uh, processes and reduce to the minimum the uh, the reliance on local natural resources it's kind of really pushing the frontiers of uh, a near zero resource production and this is very important for us for earth because at the end of the day um, the big focus of on of other farms is, is on sustainability and food security so same as uh, some car manufacturers might have a formula one team you know to test uh, the most advanced technologies and latest materials and in the toughest conditions and then once they are validated uh, they might be applied onto the day-to-day -day car you know your car my car uh, we do see our uh, space program, which is named um, Aleph Zero, as a kind of a Formula One team, if you'd like. Um, and that's very exciting to work, to work with the space agencies and, and with the, uh, those uh, cutting edge technologies. On the other hand, it's also a way for us to push forward our uh, vision for producing high quality and, and unconditional nutrition for anyone, anytime, and anywhere, uh, which is really the, the driver behind Aleph Farm's vision. Um, and, you know, if you can produce meat on the moon, you can produce meat um, in the Antarctic or in the Sahara. 
and technically want to produce meat when and where it is produced um, and, you know, anywhere people live. Uh, so, you know, th this, um, production, this production in space is really a kind of taking us one step forward in our ability to produce uh, meat really, really everywhere. <laughs> and that's, uh, uh, that's very fascinating. Producing meat everywhere with almost exactly. zero resources. That makes Aleph Farms the Formula One of uh, cultivated meat production. I love that and I won't forget it. Um, well, okay, you're talking about, as you say, you know, Aleph Farms trying to make meat in space and being successful doing that. These are very complicated situations that you're putting yourself in. What kind of help have you had? I mean, Israel seems to be a very supportive government and you've got some great in incubators there. T talk to me about your team and what kind of help you have. Yes, yeah, sure. Israel is a, is a great ecosystem for starting a, a company like uh, Aleph Farms and other cultivated meat companies. Um, in our case, we uh, started the company with a, a the, uh, the kitchen hub, which is a uh, food tech hub, and mm. uh, affiliated with uh, the Strauss Group, which is a local food company with, with global activities. They are the partner of PepsiCo in the US, in the uh, Sabra brand. Mm. Um, and we actually started as a tech transfer from um, the Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology, working very closely with Professor Levenberg, who has over uh, 20 years of experience in uh, tissue engineering for medical applications. Um, at MIT first, she's, uh, she has wow. worked for uh, six years with uh, Professor Bob Langer, who is one of the most renowned uh, scientists uh, ever, <laughs> and the father of tissue engineering, and then at the Technion. Um, and we have uh, really this, uh, this ecosystem, this local ecosystem, which is super supportive, you know, the, this collaboration and this uh, complementarity between the industry, the academy, the, the government is, is yeah. very supportive as well. And um, we've um, taken, we've we've had the uh, you know, the, uh, the opportunity to benefit from uh, subsidies and grants from the from the government when we started the company. Uh, I believe Israel has been the first uh, government to uh, to provide uh, grants for uh, any cultivated meat company in the world. I think you know it was in 2017, um, and that that was also part of the you know the. Um, the excitement we had uh, to really uh, um, take part in in better structuring this ecosystem and promoting um, a, a plan, a national plan for uh, um, promoting alternative proteins in Israel as a means for improving the um, resilience of our local food system and food security. In in Israel, eighty five percent of the beef is imported, for instance, yeah. same as in many other countries in the Middle East and in uh, in uh, in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, but also improving the, um, the environmental impact of the food production and uh, um, uh, seeing uh, alternative protein as a as a growth engine. And the visit of the Prime Minister of Israel it, at Alephant was actually part of a larger scope effort for promoting this plan, which have, have been uh, put together by by GFI. We've uh, supported mm -hmm. them and uh, taken a part in a, in a, 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 in building it. Uh, but they, they really took the lead. Um, and it's uh, involving six different um, ministries. So it's a really, you know, nationwide, very large scale uh, plan we're, we're pushing there. And it, it can be done only in Israel. I think uh, uh -huh. the, the environment is uh, very supportive for that. Again, so much to unpack there. Um, just, I want to summarize a little bit because you're saying a lot of great things and I want to make sure people are hearing and understanding. So there's this, been this collaboration in Israel of, um, research grants and the bringing together, not just of the tech minds, but of the tissue building um, professors around the world who might have this kind of knowledge and intel and bringing these educational institutional resources together with governmental resources and giving them an incubator like the Kitchen Hub so that they can try out this science, this kind of collaborative effort that then gets financial support it's an incredible example to the world. And as you mentioned, Israel uh, imports, I think you said 85% of its meat. Um, countries like Singapore, obviously smaller, but Singapore um, now 
imports 90% of all its food, not just its meat, and as you say, the Middle East, et cetera. So many countries around the world are having this issue. And I'm always surprised that I don't see more investment from countries like the US, because I think the pandemic has shown us that pandemics, which come from, can come from meat and eating meat and farming meat and factory farm situations, either because there's an overuse of antibiotics or just because the animals themselves aren't social distancing, they're living on top of each other, beak to beak, snout to snout. You're seeing how pandemics disrupt food supplies and job markets. And so as we seek to have stable economies, you would think that all governments would be very interested in stabilizing their food source. And this is a great way to do that. And I haven't really seen that much coming from the US really. There was one grant recently that was $3.5 million, but very small compared to Canada and Israel and Singapore and other countries. So um, it's very exciting to see Netanyahu make that public appearance to a left farms and be so supportive. Do you anticipate a more support coming from him in this area? And he seems to have an animal rights interest perhaps as well. Right? Yes, definitely. Yes, he's uh, very much involved with uh, uh, animal rights and uh, very sensitive to animal rights. Oh. That's also probably one of the the driver behind uh, uh, you know his uh, support and and also you know this environment you mentioned before in Israel we have one of the highest rate of uh, vegans in the world, yeah. and I believe that this uh, environment is also part of this uh, supportive ecosystem uh, which we we can find here locally. Yeah. Well, you are definitely a scientist. So this question might be out of left field, but do you see any geopolitical tensions in terms of food supplies around the world as we go from 7.6 billion people to 9.8 billion people on the planet, but we're not getting more land and we're not getting more water. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that the the, the question how to feed 9 billion people in 2040 is not the right question. Ah, I think, okay. I think <laughs> it, it's just missing the point. The, the real point is how to feed 7.8 billion people today. Ah. We're already using 1.7 uh, planets uh, to support human activity on Earth and, and the resources of 1.7 planet Earth. And, and we've lost 30% of our arable land during the last 50 years. Uh, Agriculture is using 70% of our fresh water withdrawals, which is uh, which is huge. And we do see already tensions um, uh, in a, um, in a food, uh, uh, political tensions uh, mm -hmm. related to food supply uh, during uh, COVID-19, for instance. There was a lot of uh, stress on the, the global trade and uh, global transportation in Asia, for instance, where most of the food is uh, imported and most of the meat has been imported for the last uh, decade, China, for instance, imports 90% uh, of its beef, Japan 65%. Uh, there had been a lot of uh, uh, stress in the, in, the, in the food supply chain. Uh, and the global trade has, uh, has decreased for the second year in a row in uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. And the many countries are implementing proactively food security plans, not only Singapore, but also Japan, China. Um, and we do see that uh, food security, for instance, in, in, in the Middle East can be a driver for um, regional collaboration and uh, driving uh, um, economic development and, and peace in the region. We believe, uh, for instance, that many of our um, neighboring countries, like the UAE, uh, for instance, which, uh, which we have uh, normalized the relations recently, Bahrain and uh, maybe Saudi Arabia soon, are sharing a lot of uh, the same food security issues as Israel and uh, building a common platform and, and uh, developing this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, those technologies to address regional issues can be significant driver in, uh, in peace and global stability. I don't want to misquote you, but I wouldn't let this opportunity go by. Are you saying that cultivated meat could be what brings peace to the Middle East? Of course, I'm one of the pieces of the puzzle. I think what I mean that wow. economic collaboration and solving co joint issues uh, of uh, neighboring countries is definitely, you know, a kind of a, a glue to put those countries together, to work together and to overcome similar issues together. And I believe that food security is today in the Middle East and in Asia in general, a significant issue on the table and cultivated meat being, uh, in my views, you know, one of the key solutions to promote this protein transition toward more food security by producing um, high quality nutrition 
in an unconditional manner anytime, anywhere. I will have a significant role in that. We have solved world peace and food insecurity right here on the Plant-Based Business uh -huh. Hour. Uh, that's the most inspirational thing I've heard in a very long time. Um, I will quote you on that and uh, refer many people to that section of this interview who may or may not be interested in food issues, but who are interested in uh, Middle East peace issues. So thank you for that. Well, so when we talk about geopolitical issues and food tensions and you know, obviously where the world is going, we're talking about future generations. So you have something called... Z board, and I love this concept. Tell us what this is. Yes, it's very important for us and, and really part of our DNA. Um, the, the purpose of Aleph Farms is to um, leave a better legacy to the future generations. Um, and actually, I'm myself 47 years old, almost 48. And I really want to make sure that those future generations are part of building the vision for the company. And all and um, a stakeholder at Aleph Farms as uh, the you know the um, the generation which will uh, hopefully benefit from uh, this transition we we aim at uh, driving globally. Uh, so the the idea behind the, the Z board, which is a, a group of uh, Generation Z leaders, uh, which we have uh, identified and working with in, in different parts of the world, we have uh, teenagers from. Uh, New Zealand, from Hong Kong, uh, Canada, France, the US, Israel, working together with us on uh, developing the, the vision for, for cultivated meat for the food system. And we take this as an input for us to drive uh, our uh, strategies and, and long-term plans. Again, one more bit of inspiration coming from DD, DDA Tubia out of Israel, where it's almost midnight in Israel, I believe. Uh, that is so commonsensical and yet uh, groundbreaking that a major innovation corporation would ask high schoolers, ultimately the people who are affected by the innovation they're creating, to form their own board and share their visions for the future. Are, are you also seeking their ideas about what to grow or how to grow it? Or you're basically staying with the environmental perspective of Gen Z? Oh, we have a uh, very open discussions about uh, um, everything. <laughs> wow, wow. Your, your kids just must be so proud. They just must be over <laughs> the moon that you're their dad. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, so exciting. Okay, so if you're talking about having, you know, high schoolers on your board or uh, an affiliate board, um, you're talking about conversations with the general public. Again, Israel being the highest in the world of per capita vegans. So you have a consumer base that is already perhaps open to this idea. But I'm wondering so much of these kind of tech companies focus on tech, tech, tech first. And then they think about, oh gosh, how am I going to explain this to the consumer? So have you started to think about what that conversation is going to look like with the average consumer? Yeah, of course. We're talking with consumers all the time. You know, uh, first we've been the, you know, I believe the only company in this space to open a visitor center last year. And we've had uh, um, groups uh, coming in from any parts of the world, you know, from Brazil, from the US, from uh, from Canada, from um, Australia, um, teenagers. Uh, we have, you know, grandfathers coming with their grandchildren to, to, to learn what cultivated meat is. Uh, so that's <laughs> really moving. And uh, I think... The, the approach of other farms, I believe, is uh, articulated around the uh, two axes. The first one is uh, openness and transparency. I think that the, in order to, um, to build the trust with the consumers uh, about this new production method, we need to be open and transparent. Um, and I believe that those are some inherent values of cultivated meat. You know, um, today when you purchase um, a steak, uh, or maybe, you know, not you, someone else uh, purchases a steak in a, in a grocery store, it's a black box. You have no idea where it comes from. There is a zero transparency. Cultivated meat is a 100% um, uh, um, digitalized, um, a controlled uh, process for producing meat, 100% transparent, 100% traceable. And uh, so we believe that transparency should be part of our DNA, part of the product, part of the vision of the company and the values uh, we are promoting um, in, the, in the food industry. And it should start with, you know, communicating with the consumers very early on um, as we uh, develop those uh, new approaches. 
The second aspect, which is important, you are talking about sense. We don't see LF Farms as a as a sense based company. Um, oh, um, the 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 core of LF Farms is uh, um, emotions. Uh, we believe that we we design emotions rather than develop a, a tech based products. Uh, I mean, obviously, the underlying um, uh, production process involved a lot of deep tech. And we have one of the, you know, the, the best team in the world in terms of a, of a scientific level. I'm very lucky to work with uh, Dr. Neta Lavon and her team, but Professor Levenberg, who are the kind of, uh, for me, you know, I learn from them every every day. But at the end of the day, the, the, the core business of other farms and the, the, um, the product we bring to the market is not a tech product, it's an emotional product. And when we, um, when we grow meat, uh, we we have the ability to really design to um, to shape uh, the emotions this product will um, uh, evoke for for the consumer, and and we really do see ourselves as a, as a, a designers of emotions and and artists first. You know, if you look at the um, historically, uh, you know Leonardo da Vinci and all those huge scientists were were all artists uh, to start with. And I think that, you know, when um, the industrial revolution started and there was a need for a mass of engineers to kind of support, you know, uh, you know, factories and, and industrialization of processes, that there had been a kind of disconnection between technology and art. But I think that even today, the top 1% of the best scientists and technologists in the world are primarily artists. And I work with artists at iPhones, uh, which are uh, also scientists. I love that you say this. Going back historically, at least I'm using Leonardo da Vinci as an example. So engineers as artists, as nature lovers. I mean, da Vinci took everything, all of his art, all of his drawings um, from waterfalls and how leaves turn. And that's how he got a sense of motion. And so we're back to this triangle of um, the mathematics of nature, if you will. I mean, it's so poetic. I can see that link to artistry at Aleph Farms. That's really exciting. And I love that you're talking about being designers of emotions, because ultimately, that's how you will sell to the customer. And I want to see this sold everywhere and very successful and that this transition um, to take place. So I love that you're already thinking about the emotional connection that's in the food and how that will be part of the consumer's lives. And I also love that you have um, a, a physical location that's open to the public. And if it were not for COVID, I would be there myself. I think this is a, a moment in history, you know, a hundred years from now, they'll look back at this point in time and they'll say, these were the key players and this is what was happening. So when you talk about a grandfather with their grandchildren, I think that's it. This is one generation going from the typewriter to the computer, from the landline to the cell phone, from animal agriculture to cultivated meat. And it's this patching of the torch from generation to generation, it's it's so very exciting. Okay, so you've talked a little bit about predictions. You said that it's not a prediction, I guess it's a fact. So Left Farms will have a product to market by 2022, that product being steak. But I'm wondering if beyond what you will actually be doing, because you already know all about that, but your general predictions beyond a Left Farms, where do you see the market of plant-based food, fermented proteins and cultivated meat. Where do you see those going? I used to ask this question in the next 10 years, then it was five years. Now I'm gonna say in the next three to five years. Yes, I believe that in the, in the next uh, three, five, 10 years, we'll, we'll see um, different categories of products, um, you know, developing in, in, into the market and definitely plant-based products are, you know, uh, here to stay and uh, are, are a category which uh, is uh, developing and it's a uh, it's a great uh, uh, you know a great uh, opportunity for for companies to to bring uh, products to the market for for people who would prefer plants and um, we believe cultivated meat will be a separate category of uh, of products um, okay. which will build on a different value proposition and um, we do see um again precise fermentation more as a uh, 
you know, replacing functional proteins rather than uh, whole products. We won't see, you know, a, a, you know, a, a whole milk, you know, product kind of 100% product by precise fermentation, but rather specific proteins, whey or, or casein. And same with the with eggs. Um, I do believe that the, the meat industry will not disappear tomorrow morning. And I, I'm sorry to uh, maybe <laughs> disappoint some of the um, uh, audience uh, here, but I think that we, we do see um, a trend for reverting to more extensive, more respectful ways uh, to farm animals. And uh, mm -hmm. we see that in Europe, we start to see that in, in the US as well. I believe that the um, animal-based um, livestock industry will shrink and will uh, refocus on, on more um, regenerative type of uh, practices. Um, so overall, we see you know different categories of products coexisting, um, each with a slightly different value proposition. Um, and we're working uh, you know very hard and, and uh, day after day to really refine the exact value of, of uh, cultivated meat and how they should be positioned within this uh, evolving environment. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree with you. It's not going to be from one day to the next that we have cultivated meat only. I think it's going to be this shrinkage and then it's going to be this blending. So you're going to see, you know, plant-based proteins with maybe animal proteins. Paul Shapiro is working on this mm -hmm. now. Then you'll see um, even cultivated meat or fat into plant-based proteins to, to, you know, I just think it's going to morph and morph and morph until the younger right. generation says, I can't believe that my grandparents farmed animals. Like what was wrong with them? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point because, you know, until, uh, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, there were uh, vegetarians and uh, omnivores, meaning, so either you, you add just plants right. or you add meat and, and the plant-based product were not really you know good enough to really uh, appeal for um be appealing for uh, uh, for omnivores and today the plant-based products are getting better and are kind of uh, taking more market share from meat into the meat eater category on the other hand there is a, a larger mar market uh, uh, for flexitarians which you know are interested to reduce their meat consumptions but still do eat meat and and that there is no clear borderline, you know, between vegetarians and meat eaters as we had ten years ago, and there's a high level of fragmentation to them. There is, there is, a, a, we believe, a, a significant significant room for what we call hybrid products, which would be some type of a mix or blend between different solutions, definitely. Yes. Uh, cheers to that. Uh, or should I say Laheim? <laughs> my my one word that I know. Laheim. Okay. Uh, but I have two, no, one more question for you and then like a super fast exit question. So again, this question I used to say 10 years, but now we can change this to five years or maybe three to five years. What do you wish you knew, let's say five years ago that you know now? Uh, well, that's a that's a great question. Uh, I I can't tell you what I what I learned uh, during the the last ten years or twenty years, which I, uh, I hope I knew <laughs> at the time. I think what's really important for for an entrepreneur to be successful, and in general for uh, uh, companies and startup to to thrive, is a uh, is uh, uh, humility. I think you really have to be humility to be humble when you when you uh, bring new solutions to the market that that th th there might be a pitfall you know for entrepreneurs and and uh, uh, you know tech guys to invent something and and be sure that they they have the solution and that they, they will conquer the world and and this the solution that will sell to, to to the world it doesn't work like that really i think that the environment is very complex especially when we we're talking about the the food uh, ecosystem and the meat ecosystem. There are a lot of stakeholders. You are, you will really have to be attentive, to be um, sensitive to the uh, mm -hmm. to the real issues of each of the stakeholders and and work hand in hand with uh, um, other players in the space. And um, maybe uh, compromise on, on some of you know your your opinions to to be successful and uh, not necessarily be right every time. I mean, and that's the way to drive the, the largest impact on the long term. So um, I, I would uh, recommend to anyone um, 
considering being an entrepreneur and uh, to make sure that he develops this uh, humidity and uh, value which um, is key to succeed on the long term. I love that humility being the success, uh, the key to success in the long term, which brings us back to world peace. So you see everybody, uh, it really is world peace. We're solving the world's problems right here with Cultivated Meat on the Plant-Based Business Hour. Two really fast questions on our way out. Of course, it is way past your bedtime, almost midnight in Israel. Okay, if you are having a hard day, something didn't go your way. A lot of people have had those during COVID. It's just a tricky situation. Is there a phrase that you tell yourself to get yourself back in the game? That's a good question. Uh, there might not be just one. Uh, um, I I like very much the the Nike ad of the eighties. Just do it. You know, <laughs> if you believe something is right, just do it. Uh, you know, if you're trying to to uh, judge too much or to weight all the considerations, and you know, it, at the end of the day, you might not do what you believe is right you know it, 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 you might not always uh, get where you like to be you might not succeed in everything but at least when you when you have a strong belief something should be done just do it yeah, I love that. Uh, time waits for no one, and we don't have time to waste, folks. So if you've got a great idea that you think is going to change the future and make life better for everyone, just as DDA Tubia, CEO of Aleph Farms, is doing here, uh, no time to waste. Get to it. And if you fall flat on your face, get up and keep going. So that's what we all do. That's what every day is like for all of us. So no shame in this game. Get to work, everybody. Okay, my very last question for you. You are busy. You're running around. You're you're crazy in the lab you have no time for lunch what's your favorite snack um carrots carrots oh <laughs> wow good for you carrots and hummus well you are well placed for where you are in the world that's my favorite snack carrots and hummus together might not be yours but when i think of carrots i think of hummus um and just as a side note you had mentioned earlier that the most popular hummus brand in the united states sabra is affiliated with one of your supporters, I believe. Yes. Uh, the Strauss Group, which is um, actually the, the the owner or the partner of the, the Kitchen Hub, the incubator, the yes. incubator, which uh, yes. which has uh, started the uh, other farms uh, yeah. with me. Yes, wonderful. Well, then I will eat more hummus. So thank you, Sabra. <laughs> and of course, thank you, DDA Tubia, CEO and co-founder of Aleph Farms. I'm going to say goodbye to everyone on social media, but not to DDA. So DDA, you stick around. Goodbye to everyone globally, all of my followers here on Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. We all thank you, DDA. Thank you for this incredible work that you're doing. You literally are changing the world for people, the planet, and animals. We talk about it a lot, all the time, but you actually are just doing it. So thank you for that. I'm so happy to have you on this show. Everybody, if you missed any part of this uh, interview or you'd like to hear it again because, you know, there's a little bit of an accent and maybe you're thinking, gosh, I want to hear that again, definitely subscribe to the podcast because there was a lot of good information that came out of this interview and it is an interview that you'll want to hear twice. A lot of good stuff, including world peace. So thank you to everybody for watching. DDA, stick around. Everybody else, I will see you on Thursday. Bye, everybody. Thank you.